the first time you scuba guy or go snorkeling with a manta ray, I mean, that's an experience you will never forget. They're just such amazing creatures. I mean, when you see them swim up to you and you realize that they are quite intelligent. And they're just, yeah, very charismatic, graceful creatures. Little is known about manta rays and their close cousins, the mobula rays. Even less is being done to protect them. Looking at the populations of both manta and mobula rays, we can get an idea of how healthy the ecosystems are and if the human impact is too much or not. Today, the gills that keep them alive in the sea are also causing them to die. There are days when we catch manta and mobula rays. They can get entangled in the net and stuck for two or three days. It's good news for us though. They are a good catch because their gills fetch a high price. Gill parts are sold as Chinese medicine and said to cleanse human blood of toxins. The demand for them has spurred a lucrative and unregulated trade, killing rays much faster than they can reproduce. I'm Chan Tao Cho. This week on 101 East, we explore the trail of manta gills from the seas to the shops, threatening the existence of one of the most graceful creatures in the ocean. There are a few studies of living oceanic manta rays around the world. Each of these locations, they have not recorded more than, let's say, 80 to 100 of these living oceanic manta rays. And here in Sri Lanka, in just 131 days of survey, I recorded 58 dead oceanic manta rays. The large majority of these oceanic manta rays were actually juveniles and subagals, which means they're not even breeding yet and they've been killed before that. Marine biologist Daniel Fernando has been surveying Sri Lanka's fishing industry for over two years. Today he's in the western coastal town of Nigambo at one of the country's busiest fish markets. He's passionate about saving manta and mobula rays from extinction. I started this simply because I, I mean I was scuba diving and the first time you scuba dive or go snorkeling with a manta ray, I mean that's an experience you will never forget. And you think that such a large species could just go extinct in 10 years, that's, yeah, that's quite scary. Over a thousand fishing boats dock and depart from this harbour. This morning's bounty includes more than 100 mobula rays. They're similar to mantas, but smaller. Daniel also heads the conservation group Manta Trust and is researching vital information needed to convince authorities that the species cannot sustain the slaughter. We know that these animals have very slow life cycles, so when you see the numbers that are being landed at the markets, you don't have to be a genius to figure out that it's not sustainable. With a wingspan of up to 7 metres, manta rays are believed to be at least 15 to 20 years old by the time they are ready to breed. A mature female usually produces one pup every two to five years, with each pregnancy lasting a year. Scientists estimate they live more than 50 years. Less is known about their mobular cousins, except they have a similar, slow reproductive cycle. So an entire school could be wiped out on a single fishing trip and never replaced. <laughs> Researchers record some 100,000 rays netted by fisheries each year, mostly in Sri Lanka, Indonesia and India. Most of them are mobulars and many catches remain undocumented. My ocean surveys focus on living populations around Sri Lanka. We have a large number of juveniles that are being landed at the market and this is the largest number of juveniles that has been recorded anywhere in the world so far. So it is highly likely that there is a nursery ground in Sri Lanka and it could be of great importance to ensure that it gets the protection that it requires. Ideally, I would like to find some large aggregations of either manta or mobile areas just off the coast of Sri Lanka because this would 
give us a better idea of their populations, of their lives, and also hopefully provide a you know, sustainable alternative such as ecotourism. I think they are nearby. We see large numbers of resident blue whales here in Sri Lanka, and coincidentally both the blue whales and the manta rays feed on the exact same thing, which is krill and plankton. So they are probably in the same area. The only difference is that the whales have to come to the surface to breathe, so it's quite easy to see them. With the manta population plunging, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, added them to its list of vulnerable species in 2011. When species aggregate, they are, they are extremely vulnerable to fishing pressure because uh, most of them aggregate to spawn. And at that time, you can really wipe them out. It's difficult to convince fishermen to keep away from something of economic significance to them out at sea. And also it is very difficult to convince them whatever that is caught in their nets to release them. In Sri Lanka, fishing boats travel hundreds, sometimes thousands of kilometres, as far west as Somalia, even crossing the Indian Ocean to Indonesia. They cast nets for tuna, sailfish and swordfish, often landing rays as bycatch. Until recent years, fishermen like Nyanadasa avoided them. They entangle and damage nets and their meat is cheap. We used to release those that were still alive. We even cut our nets to free them. Now we don't release them even if they completely mess up the nets. The market has really increased for their gills in the last few years. They are profitable because they are dried and exported. One kilo of manta gills fetches $140. The Sri Lankan government encourages fishermen to use long-line fishing. It reduces bycatch, though not completely. Nyanadasa's boat has a long line with over 300 hooks able to spread out over several kilometres in the sea. But he prefers nets. You can pull in 50 to 60 sharks with this line, or up to 100. But sometimes you get nothing not even enough to pay for fuel. If we are lucky, the net catches three or four hundred kilos in a couple of days and we can go home. The net will always catch something, be it ray, shark or tuna. Always. When we lay out three, four hundred hooks and get nothing, it frustrates us to death. Near the fish market in Ngambo, we find a warehouse dealing with rays bought fresh off the boat. Today, we bought about 120 to 130 rays. We bring them here, where the workers clean them. Some cut up the heads, others wash and salt them, and the rest remove the gills. That's how we process them. We don't salt the gills, though. We dry them. With the hot sun, it will dry within a day and a half. Mobula gills are 80 to 120 dollars a kilo, and manta gills are 160 a kilo. The buyers come from China and India. The Chinese buyers take whatever we have and pay up front. It's better for us. They come once every one or two months and usually call in advance. They always return for more. They buy from dealers all over Sri Lanka. Anytime there's an order, an exporter in Sri Lanka can easily round up 200 kilograms of dried gills within a week. That's the rough equivalent of 500 dead mobula rays or 100 mantas. The prized parts of the gills are known as gill plates they filter plankton out of water that passes through the ray for it to feed on. The trail of gill plates takes us to Hong Kong, southern China. Liang Yongchao runs a dried seafood shop. It sells anything from under the sea, 
including what we're looking for. Manta gill plates cost $420 a kilogram here, two and a half times more than in Sri Lanka, and similar to the price of mid-ranged shark fins. Liang Yongchao swears by the medicinal benefits. Yongsumafangsa 這個有中醫的根據嗎?中醫好多樣東西都是早上傳下來的,現在你說有什麼根據呢? Several shops selling gill plates tell us they buy their stock from mainland China in the southern city of Guangzhou. It's a three-hour train ride from Hong Kong. Here, dried seafood wholesalers fill up entire blocks along this street. We use a hidden camera to get an idea of the sheer volume of trade. We see shop after shop selling sackfuls of dried gill plates of both mobular and manta rays. They range between $160 and $450 a kilogram for walk-in customers. Conservation groups say most of the world's gill plates come through Guangzhou before further export to other parts of Asia. The trading volume, an estimated 60 to 80,000 kilos a year, is worth over 11 million dollars. The stock here includes gill plates from rays caught locally as well. There is no such medicine in the history of Chinese medical texts. Traditional Chinese medicine goes back thousands of years. It was government regulated for at least 2,000 years. From the Qin dynasty all the way back to the Tang dynasty. There were medical classics and laws on how to prescribe medicine, how to train doctors. Dr. Chen Hong is a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine, or TCM. He also teaches the subject in Hong Kong's local universities. Dr. Chen warns against self-medication using manta gill plates, even if they turn out to be medicinal. All medicines have a toxic nature. Everyone knows ginseng is used as a tonic. Yet people can die from an overdose. You must be careful even with medicines for coughs and colds. Treatment differs from person to person. In recent times, Chinese give foreigners the impression that traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, is responsible for destroying tiger populations, for driving rhinoceroses to extinction. There is some truth in that. But this wouldn't happen if there is stricter government regulation, coupled with greater awareness of TCM. People need to know that illness doesn't require rhino horns or tiger bones or manta gill plates. TCM treatment emphasizes the medicinal nature of a product, 
not the product itself. I asked Dr Chen to explain the concept of heatiness which drives so many Chinese to buy products like gill plates. The yin and yang elements in your body have to balance out. You have vital energy because of nourishment from what you eat. If it travels healthily in your body, there will not be heat. Overnourishment is one of the things that causes heat. It leads to dryness in the mouth, ulcers, bloodshot eyes, or malignant tumors and so on. Everything is a result of the upset harmony between the yin and yang elements. Purging heat need not require medicine. There are other means, including massage and acupuncture. With fish stock declining worldwide, the heat is on for fishermen like Nyanadasa and his crew in Sri Lanka. Sometimes when we put out the net, we can't even catch enough to feed ourselves and also pay for fuel. These days, they see mobilers and mantas as more valuable than just bycatch in the nets. We get on top of the boat and keep a watch. And if we spot any, we try to spear them. If there's no money, our lives will suffer. So if there are fish, we have to catch them. Daniel Fernando's fieldwork takes him to another fish market in the southern coastal town of Marissa. He understands why fishermen feel threatened by conservation. How sensitized are fishermen here, do you think, to the conservation side of things? Well, fishermen always view conservation as a threat to their livelihood. I mean, ultimately, we're trying to do it to ensure that species do not go extinct. You know, we're not doing it to make their lives harder. We would like to ensure that there's enough fish in the ocean for them to continue fishing for the rest of their lives. Our presence soon makes some fishermen uncomfortable. They pull us aside to ask what we're doing. Is there any problem, sir? Huh? Any problem? Yes, they have problems, many problems. Before some media people came, they took the many photos. <coughs> <coughs> After the government stopped the catch the shark. Fishermen here value sharks for their meat and fins. But under international pressure, Sri Lanka banned the fishing of endangered thresher sharks last year though other species are still permitted. The law hurt their pockets, and many now see rays as an alternative. Today, a kilogram of dried gill plates fetches more than a kilo of shark fins in Sri Lanka, but they'll have to kill more rays to make one kilo. Conservationists worldwide are racing against time to get more scientific data for population studies and push for a trading ban. What are you looking out for? This is basically a Mobila japonica. So this is one of the species that I'm focusing on here. We try and evaluate, first of all, whether it's a male or a female. And this is actually a female, and it does look quite mature. And the most important measurement will be the gisk width here. So actually, if you can give me a hand. Sure. Just hold it at the end of the wing there. So this is at about 205 centimeters, which is quite big. Yeah. Basically, this particular species will max out at about 3 meters 20. So I'll also just grab a small DNA sample now. From this, basically, we're trying to find out how large these populations are all around the world. While still lacking information on the smaller mobular race, Daniel's contribution to manta research has paid off. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, or CITES, listed mantas for protection in March this year. This restricts the export of all manta parts, but there's a sting in the tail. Domestic trade is still allowed, and the law only takes effect in 18 months' time. That gives a lot of time for these manta rays to be still created and fish get large numbers. It's not the end of the battle. I mean, we're, we're just guarded. Part of the bigger strategy is to push for fishermen to change how they fish. They just pack the boats full of fish, stack them on top of each other, crush the fish at the bottom. There's not enough ice to ensure that they're properly uh, frozen. 
And then when they bring them to shore, they just chuck them off the boat onto the pier. They drag across the floor and it's usually quite unhygienic as well. And then they always wonder why they don't get high prices for the tuna that they're exporting. The low prices force them to use nets to catch more fish, driving a vicious circle. But there are more sustainable and profitable fishing techniques. In the Maldives, fishermen use a pole and line method to catch tuna. They hook up fewer fish, but of better quality and worth several times more in the export market. They usually spray water into the ocean, which creates a lot of activity in the water. The tuna thinks that there's a lot of feeding going on in the water, so they come to the surface. And they basically have a hook and a line, which is just thrown without any bait, and they're able to hook the tuna on this. And, and the tuna is very fresh, they're not damaged at all, and you're only targeting tuna. There's no other fish that will be caught with this technique, and it is very sustainable. The government says it's ready to do its part, but change will take time. We cannot uh, um, change the fishing practice what, uh, the of uh, gillnet uh, uh, within a short time speed. It is very difficult because the fishermen are traditional people. Uh, However, Dr. Rekha Maudaniya believes it will be much easier to stop the export of manta gill plates. So banning manta ray uh, catching or landing is not a big uh, issue. It is a very uh, insignificant quantity and when compared to shark. Many believe if Sri Lanka marketed its dive tourism, mantas could become much more significant. More and more people are visiting the country since 2010, following the end of a long-drawn civil war. Dive operator Nishan Pereira says there's a wave of revenue to ride on, given Manta Tourism is a multi-million dollar business in neighbouring Maldives. If you have guaranteed Manta Ray sightings, people are willing to book an entire holiday based on that. I mean, one of the best examples in the world and which is close to us is the Maldives where people spend anything from $1,500 to $4,000 for a week of diving on a liverboard boat uh, just to go and see manta rays. Well, when you catch a fish, whether it's a manta or something else, and you sell it, it's a one-off transaction. But Nishan feels it's also important for both conservationists and fisheries to reach a middle ground. What we would call for is better management where we maybe do a stock assessment and have quotas on the number of animals that can be taken. We have marine protected areas so that you have sanctuaries where at least some portion of the population is protected. It is not feasible for Sri Lanka to overnight ban fishing for manta rays or sharks or any other species. Uh, that would put a lot of people out of work and have negative economic impacts. It's an impact Nyanadasa doesn't need. Home from fishing, he remembers how life took a hit when he returned from a five-week fishing trip after the Boxing Day tsunami in 2004. When I reached dry land, my heart sank. Everything was destroyed. All the walls collapsed. His family survived, but Nyanadasa has since fished harder than ever to rebuild their lives. Meals together are rare. His home today, but his eldest son is out on a fishing vessel. Recently, they banned the fishing of thresher sharks. Now it's hard to survive. We don't want this ban. Even the rays, we say, don't ban them. It's hard for Nyanadasa to see the need for conservation, to look beyond its immediate impact to his family. And the key challenge ahead involves changing the minds of fishermen anchored in old ways. But time is running out. Manta rays can be used as a key indicator species in ecosystems. We have slowly started running out of the more desirable fish species, for example, tuna, swordfish, sailfish. These fish stocks are declining, and therefore fishermen are being forced to search for alternative fish stocks. We are basically fishing through the food chain. But there is one common ground for fisheries and conservationists to work on. Both want more fish in the ocean. Achieving that could be the only ray of hope for the mantas.